Ghostly Glitches, Games and Analog. Um, so we've got two great speakers and I'll introduce them um, one by one. Um, again, like before, feel free to use the chat um, to chat, but hold your questions until I give you a heads up uh, at the end and then I'll open for questions. And that just means things are easier to find. Um, Okay, so uh, first up then, Francis Hallam. Francis Hallam is a fourth year PhD researcher at the University of Surrey. Uh, their thesis entitled Tentacular Bodies, Times, Matters, Post-Human Entanglements and Oceanic Imaginaries of the 21st Century, uh, sorry, in 21st Century Science Fiction, explores intersections of ocean eroticism, queer ecologies and feminist new materialism in contemporary sci-fi. Francis has two upcoming chapters in Animals and Science Fiction by Palgrave and in the Edinburgh Companion to Science Fiction and the Medical Humanities. Um, and their paper today is titled Unknowing in the Ocean, Body Technology Interfaces in Underwater Exploration Horror Games. Over to you, Francis. Hey, thanks. Uh, let me just share my presentation. Um... Can everyone see that? Perfect. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'd also like to say that I recently submitted my thesis, so no longer a fourth year, more of a post fourth year. Um, but yeah, uh, my name is Francis, and I've changed my title a little bit. Uh, it's now Unfathomable Analog Interfaces in Lo Fi Submarine Horror Games. So in this paper, I explore the emerging microgenre of underwater exploration horror games in which the players aim to discover, uncover and record deep sea worlds using submersible technologies, but then met with horror at the unfathomable worlds they encounter. So uh, the games I'm broadly thinking with today include Water Womb World, Cold Abyss, Iron Lung, Corpse Ocean, Discover the Ocean, Turga Pressure, Full Fathom, Frontier Diver, and Rusty Barrel, uh, among some others. While this paper focuses on analog technologies present in the game's worlds, analog aesthetics in independent horror gaming are also widespread. The aesthetics of these lo-fi horror games reflect analog histories of gaming devices as they attempt to mimic the graphical and control the graphics and controls of PlayStation One and NES era gaming. As you can see on two of these games, uh, the label Haunted PS One is often used to refer to independent games which emulate 1990s horror survival gaming such as Silent Hill or Clock Tower, uh, but with a haunted media meta text, so like Matteo and Lindsay mentioned earlier. So the low fidelity of analog, control aesthetic, uh, analog console aesthetics, they're accessible to produce as a solo developer, which contributes to its popularity in the indie gaming space. But also these low polygon environments can emphasize feelings of horror as it becomes more difficult to distinguish amorphous shapes of objects on your screen, turning underwater environments itself into a horror monster. Uh, so now a quick primer. Uh, rather than lo-fi or analog aesthetics, in this paper I'm going to look at the presence of technology within the game worlds themselves. So I'm going to be looking at diegetic technologies. Um, Digetic referring to the phenomenon which exists inside the logic of the game story uh, universe itself and are experienced by the character. Uh, non diegetic elements refer to metatextual uh, features which are only experienced by the player and the character doesn't have access to. Uh, while di Sorry. Yeah. While discussions of diegetic and non diegetic usually refer to representations of sound in cinema. Uh, however, in gaming, this distinction is sometimes used to discuss user interfacing. Usually in gaming, elements such as the heads-up display, the menu and map are non-diegetic and facilitate player interactions. Uh, as you can see on this image, everything highlighted with the little pink square, those are non-diegetic uh, HUD elements. However, in many of the submarine games I'm going to be exploring, these Typically, non-diegetic elements are replaced with diegetic analog technology, which not only the player interacts with, but also the character. Across nearly all of the games mentioned, the common first person viewpoint of gaming is mediated through diegetic uses of screens and analog navigation controls on a submersible vehicle. Uh, while, containing, whilst, 
Yeah. Whilst contemporary gaming and navigational interfaces see the player use non-diegetic controllers or W ASD keys to move characters around. In these games, the player as character must navigate through ocean worlds using these old screen technology depictions and physical buttons which must be clicked analogistically, which will move camera around to explore the space. Um. So these games are examples of the exploration subgenre. Uh, the act of discovery is the core gameplay loop as a submersible vehicle travels deeper and further into the game's watery worlds. Uh, Alendra Chang argues that these games often center the player's power over natural environment, as she argues tropes of the exploration genre include the scopophilic and instrumental environmental relations characteristic of games of graphical spectacle and resource extraction, including a cartographic impulse where player or the explorer sets about penetrating the unknown and testing personal and geographical limits. However, in these games I'm exploring, with these diegetic screens, mappings and movement, the scopophilic ability for the player to explore, watch and record the world around them is frustrated, as analogue instruments of spectacle and cartography are no longer tools of control. Instead, they transform into tools of delivering a horror experience. Um. This horror emerges from diegetic glitching of these analog technologies as the games present distortions and static feedback in audio and visual output of the characters' submarines. The glitchiness of in-game navigational tools decenter the character's ability to have authority over the ocean space, as technologies of control are rendered fallible. This directly subverts the tropes of exploration genre as identified by Alenda Chang. Often these glitches are used to indicate an encroaching horror. As submersibles travel deeper into the water, the failing analog screens can crack under the immense pressure of deep sea space, such as in the games Frontier Diver and Iron Lung. In other games, the distortions of audiovisual feedback emerge because of contact with more than human monsters of the deep, creatures so unfathomable that our human analog technologies fail to capture them. Though this is used to evoke fear at its unintelligibility, the glitching of the analog also enables us to glimpse into the existence of deep sea worlds beyond comprehension. Analog interfaces being the tools of exploration renders the submersible vehicle an analog for the human body. The screens are its eyes, the navigation its limbs. As such, the submersible and its interfaces transform into the sensorial apparatus of the player and character. Here, the games blur the lines between technological and the body, but also player and character, since it is the player who must interact with the submersible, not just the character. This posthuman body as technology disturbance is made explicit in the titles of games such as Iron Lung, where the submersible functions as a breathing apparatus, and in Water Womb World, the ocean depths are a site of human horror gestation. Uh, here, the submersible metaphorically transforms. As the game Discover the Ocean begins, the human body is not fit for exploring the depths. The human body as submersible challenges the agency of the characters. Therefore, since the underwater submarine horror games blur the lines between technology and the body, the horror emerges how the human itself is susceptible to deep sea glitchings and failures. The influence of Lovecraft on this micro genre of underwater horror games is clear, with their toothy and tentacled beasts lying in wait in some deep sea space and their strange submerged architectures. Identifying Lovecraftian horror is complex, but a close approximation is by H.P. Lovecraft himself, who argues that his cosmic works instill dread through conflict with unknown spheres and powers. Uh, critic Prima Arasu argues that Lovecraftian adaptions, adaptations to video games arguably work better than in film, as they use ludic mechanics to disempower the player, uh, in which players are given incorrect, inconsistent or unreliable information about their surroundings. In submarine games, the ludic mechanics of analog exploration disempowers the character and destabilizes the player's authority over ocean space. Though the player character begins the journey with the hopes of mastering dangerous waters, they are rendered powerless in the face of the ocean's anti-humanist abyss. Uh, so as ecolo ecologist Anna Singh argues, decentering the human enables the opening up of possibilities for recognizing that humans might not always be in charge, we might get to know other than human worlds in which we participate, but which we don't always make the rules. Um, 
that was a short one from me, but yeah, thank you for listening. Uh, I would also like to say that almost all of the games that I think with here, they're mostly free to play on the itch.io independent game platform. Um, yeah, and I hope that was interesting. Thank you so much, Francis. Um, nice and short, keeping to time, that's what we like. Um, okay, so uh, our next speaker is Kane Geary O'Keefe. Uh, Kane's a researcher based in Cork, um, and they're currently poised to begin a PhD programme in film at University College Cork. Although it says currently poised in January, have you started? I, I'm starting Tuesday. Starting so. Tuesday. So so Kane is uh, about to start his PhD program uh, in film. Um, and their PhD program is titled Framing Diegetic Screen Technologies in Contemporary Horror Cinema. So obviously the symposium falls very squarely within the kind of remits of your PhD research. So what better way to start? Uh, Kane's paper today is titled Frequencies and Flesh. Framing Postmodern Cyclicality Through Analog Technologies in Rose Engines Signalis. Um, over to you. Thank you very much, Laura, and thanks for having me. So um, today I'm going to be presenting on one of my favorite games that I managed to play last year, which is 2022's Signalis. And I'm going to be talking about how it frames its story and game world through analog technology, in particular shortwave radio how that works in tandem with the game's very knowing manipulation of postmodern techniques. So just a, a brief intro to the game. It's developed by two people, a two-person team from Germany called Rose Engine. And it is a very um, old school survival horror game. It very much clamors back to the classics of the 90s. You've got your, your old Silent Hills, your own Resident Evils, your old Alone in the Dark, that kind of, that kind of vibe. I just have some, uh, some quick gameplay uh, shots here. On the left, we have a typical action shot. Um, much in the in the classic vein of uh, old survival horror, it's all about working your way around the map, uh, managing your resources, uh, dodging enemies that you barely have enough animal, ammo to deal with, uh, and dealing with puzzles along the way. Uh, we play as Elster, who is um, the android speaking in the, the second picture here, who is looking for her former mission partner and romantic partner, a woman by the name of Ariane. And on the right, we have certain elements of the gameplay which switch to a first person perspective, often in flashbacks or in certain puzzle segments. And as you can see from the polygonal uh, graphical style of the game, it's very much going for that, that 90s aesthetic, that uh, old PS1, fifth generation of consoles look. And just a brief look into the game's story world and story itself before I move on. Uh, it's a very surrealist narrative. Um, it can be quite um, difficult for the player to put it together as they're going. Uh, it takes place in multiple locations, both real and imagined in a mirrored version of our own solar system. Uh, the main dynamics between the characters are you have your human gestalts, which are humans sent on missions across the, uh, the solar system, uh, who are often paired with um, artificial replicas, who are androids imbued with the thoughts and memories of people once living, very similar to the replicants from Blade Runner. Uh, the player character, Elster, is navigating an off-planet mining facility in search for her partner, Ariane. But as she makes her way through the world, the world continues to deform and degenerate around her, uh, eventually breaking down into what can only be described as a, a monstrous uh, fleshy mass. And all its inhabitants, um, all the, the replica inhabitants of this mine has all, have also uh, gone completely insane, degenerated, deformed, and want to kill you. Um, which brings us to our end goal, uh, finding Ariane. And the thing about Ariane is that within the context of Signalis's world, she is what is known as bioresonant, meaning she has the ability to tap into certain signals that allow for telepathy, telekinesis, and reality warping. And it's revealed that the, uh, she, so she is, she's dying. Um, she's dying from radiation poisoning and is stuck unconscious inside a pod. And her unconscious uh, bioresonant signal is actually causing the world around her to exist inside a time loop. Um, essentially meaning that the world around her, the world you explore during the game and its inhabitants, have been through a cycle of events uh, 50, 100, 2,000, possibly millions of times, to the point where copies upon copies upon copies of the world have built up on each other, deforming and degenerating the world and characters within them. And the thing about this bioresonant radio signal in terms of analog technology is that it manifests itself as a shortwave radio signal. Uh, we know this from the gameplay, as certain enemies also have bioresonant abilities and tuning your in-game radio to the same frequency they emit causes a feedback loop, driving those enemies insane and allowing you to defeat them. Um, in terms of Ariane's signal specifically, it actually um, is based on a, a, a real radio signal, the three-note oddity, uh, which was part of the Magpie signal, which was broadcast from Hungary uh, to Germany 
in order to transmit codes um, during the Cold War. And it actually ran up in 2005. It would be broadcasted as a three note hum coupled with different um, numbers, which could then be used to decode signals and messages. Um, I'm just going to play the uh, small bit of the signal uh, because it actually becomes somewhat of a leitmotif for Ariane's character and her relationship to Elsa throughout the game. And it's also just pretty, cre pretty creepy. And uh, we don't, it plays multiple times throughout the game. And it's not until we understand the full context of the story where we understand its meaning. So I'll just play some for you there now. Uh, I would recommend turning up your volume. And it is this constantly broadcasting signal from the unconscious Ariane that is warping the reality of the, the world around her. Uh, it's not the only use of analog technology within Signalis. It very knowingly plays with analog technology and analog forms, uh, not content with just hammering back to games of the 90s. It also looks back on a lot of uh, dead media from before that time. Um, once again, I, as I mentioned before, you have a radio mechanic, which is used for different puzzles. Um, your your game is saved on CTR TV, uh, CRTV um, um, monitors. Various cutscenes in the game have VHS filters and glitches within them. And also taking damage and other certain status effects during the gameplay breaks down the screen of the game into uh, its singular video components as seen on the, the bottom right here. So um, Signalis readily engages with and kind of subverts a lot of typical uses of analog within the survival horror genre. And um, a lot of the theories on uh, the analog and the survival horror genre focus on the fact that in a, a completely virtual world, for both the player and the player character, physical items, physical, physical analog and physical analog technologies help to ground the player and the player character in a sense of reality. Um, that is why in the often supernaturally tinged and corrupted worlds of your Resident Evils and Silent Hills, a lot of the puzzles deal with physical objects that have a tangible sense of physical touch in the real world. Um, paintings, um, it's why uh, you find out about the game world through handwritten notes left around the world, it's why other puzzles deal with musical instruments and other technologies. It's why you save your game on physical objects. In Resident Evil, you save on a typewriter. Um, in some of the more recent ones, you save on a tape recorder. In Signalis, you save on a CRTV. Um, in certain games, you write down on notepads, things like this. And as such, both the player and the player character is encouraged to trust the authenticity of physical objects found in the game world. Um, one of the most famous examples of this is James Sunderland in Silent Hill 2, uh, who, despite having spent tens of hours, around 10 hours-ish, in the, the hell house of, of Silent Hill dealing with monsters, uh, relatively unfazed, it is the VHS tape that reveals his relationship with, uh, to his wife and the fact that he had a part to play for death that eventually cracks him and eventually drives him insane. Um, the VHS is what convinces him of this truth. And how Signalis um, subverts this is that when you find a uh, photograph up here on the left of yourself with Ariane, your partner, um, in typical survival horror um, rules, we're supposed to believe this photo, or we're supposed to believe that this is the one we're looking for. Uh, however, uh, after the prologue ends, the player wakes up and Elsa also wakes up and the photo has changed. And the developers do this very intentionally as it actually changes without any acknowledgement of the fact. Um, most players will play through the game without even noticing at uh, first time that this has actually changed, which uh, then undermines both the player and player characters' uh, ability to trust in the authenticity of these analog objects and this analog media. And at the same time, analog technologies are often used as a way of um, dispelling with or detecting supernatural um, forces, monsters, things like that. Um, this is most obviously seen in the games like the Fatal Frame series, where you use a old camera to dispel ghosts uh, and detect ghosts, or in the radios of the Silent Hill games, whose radio static allows you to detect uh, monsters. The thing about Signalis is that rather than using analog technology as a way to detect or dispel the supernatural, the in Signalis, analog becomes the supernatural in and of itself. All of these supernatural occurrences that happen in Signalis, the degeneration of the world, the breakdown of its characters, the surreal narrative, is all caused by the time loop caused by the emitting radio signal. Rather than being used to detect, it becomes the supernatural in and of itself. And the game's use of analog technology and way of, ways of using it as a story framing device 
act as a key for understanding signalysis and manipulation of postmodern techniques, particularly intersubstitutionality and um, a cyclical series of intertextual references. Um, it's very much trying to destabilize its own sense of temporality and sense of space by constantly pulling um, locations and texts from different time periods, different locations, all together to destroy the game's own sense of interiority in order to further press this sense of a broken down world in conjunction with what it's trying to achieve through the radio signal. It's trying to achieve a lawless and constant self spatial self-transformation into other spaces and create its own annihilation of temporality by constantly pulling from other texts in order to destroy that sense of space and time. And one of the more uh, explicit uh, ways that the game goes about this is in the second half of the game, you inhabit a game world known as Nowhere. Now, this is the later half of the game in which the game world has completely broken down into a fleshy, rusty, corroded mass uh, where meaning is very, very hard to find. And it's very much a visual elicitation of Nowhere from uh, most mainline Silent Hill games. Um, at random points during the uh, Silent Hill games or sometimes triggered by the player, the world will switch into uh, its Nowhere version, a mirrored version, which is uh, also denoted by rusted metal, fleshy masses, and overly aggressive enemies. And in pulling these literal, they even share a name, uh, they're both called Nowhere. It's it's very much like, uh, it's not subtle at all. Um, but very much in terms of pulling these locations from different um, texts and pulling these um, texts from different time periods, it's very much trying and attempting to achieve that destroyed sense of space, space and time. And this is referenced by in-game characters as well. Uh, the game's antagonist says, it's like everything was taken apart and put back together by someone who doesn't understand how it works. And uh, while this is very much a reference to Ariane and the fact that she doesn't, she's not conscious, she's not aware of the fact that she's pulling this world apart and putting it together over and over and over again at infinitum. And um, the developers on the other hand are very aware of what they're doing. Um, and what they're doing is when they're pulling all these texts together, they're, they're doing it to uh, blur all oppositional, all oppositions between real imaginary, true, false, good and evil. They're really aiming for, uh, uh, a blurred sense of reality within the game world by pulling from these different texts. And there's a litany of, uh, of examples, like this doesn't even begin to cover the amount of um, intertextual references found in Signalis. It's, it's bursting at the seams and it's very intentional bursting at the seams. You've got references to classic anime here at the top in Neon Genesis and Evangelion. Uh, you've got references to classic paintings. You've got the shore of oblivion in the middle left. You've got uh, the Isle of the Dead on the middle right. And what's notable about these paintings um, as well is that despite the fact that they're done by separate artists, there's actually, the art, each respective artist created multiple versions of each respective painting over a period of 10 to 15 years. A lot of these intertextual references deal with the idea of copies, of a copy of a copy of a copy and the breakdown of meaning that comes with uh, copying something over and over and over and over again until the, the meanings attached to those singular objects break down. You've also got references to classic horror texts, classic cosmic horror texts, such as The Festival by H.P. Lovecraft and Robert W. Chambers, The King in Yellow. And there's just so many to, to pull from. And in terms of postmodern criticism, um, a, a big theorist on the postmodern, Baudrillard, has said that most modern, the main problem with postmodern texts is that they create what's called an improvisation of meaning, of nonsense, or of several simultaneous senses which sketch each other out. And this is often used in criticism of postmodern texts that in place of meaning that they're actually pulling from other texts um, to disguise their own lack of meaning. And what's notable about Signalis is that this is actually very intentional. Uh, it's not trying to mask anything. Uh, it's not fair to criticize its intertextuality as just a, a blurring together of different texts. It's, it's, it's very intentionally done in order to extend and cement the idea of a broken down reality as conveyed by the radio signal. Um, it's all of these texts, all of these references, all entice separate readings of the game, but all of them cancel each other out. Uh, you only get so far um, with, with a lot of them. And it's very much uh, an intentional way of convoluting the interiority of the game, of creating separate readings which cancel each other out and create this sense of nonsense, create this sense of breakdown and create this sense of broken down reality in order to focus squarely on um, the story itself, which is the um, finding your partner area. And this also suggests uh, a maturation of um, video games and survival horror games as, as a whole. 
Um, it's very much aware of its uh, of itself, the fact that it's written out of the different games and texts that it's made. And it very much suggests uh, a move from postmodernity towards a sense of uh, metatextuality in games. So that's that's not new. Uh, like there's not like um, a lot of the games that Francis was talking about uh, with a lot of the old PS1 style games and stuff. It's very much becoming a trend that games are becoming much more aware of their, their place in time and the maturation of, of a genre. And this sense of self-reflexivity is definitely something that's going to become more prominent in recent years. And for a medium that's a lot younger than film and uh, the novel and other sort of texts that have reached self-reflexivity a long time ago, um, it's, a, it's an exciting sense of maturity for the genre that I'm sure will be explored in, uh, in, in years to come. And just to conclude, once again, uh, the framing of the game world's generation to analog uh, allows it to subvert and engage with previous uses of analog and remediation in the survival horror genre. And this works in tandem with the um, postmodern techniques of intersubstitutionality and intertextuality within the context of the breakdown of the game world, uh, which suggests a, a structural maturation for gaming in general. And I just have my references. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kane, um, and thank you to Francis. Okay, I'm going to open the Q and A. Um, I'll start with one for Francis. Actually, um, a really interesting paper. Thank you very much. I don't know anything about these games, so uh, I, I appreciate uh, uh, learning about them. Um, there's some great band names there as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I thought it was really interesting this idea you were talking about the idea of technology kind of acting as an extension of the body in these games so the screen for eyes and so on um and 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 that idea is like the support support for a human body which can't support itself in the ocean yeah. that the that the body is not equipped to deal uh, with the ocean and i just think it's kind of really interesting that right at a time when you know we we might be using ai to explore like the extension of the body and to kind of to kind of further the idea of what we consider to be human, that these games are engaging with kind of very analog uh, technology and a very kind of analog look and feel that perhaps doesn't extend that idea of the human in the same way or as smoothly or as or in such an advanced way as something like AI might. Um, I've done that thing where there isn't really a question there. I guess you know what's the appeal to 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 players of the kind of of the analog feature rather than rather than that being kind of kind of you know um, engaging with kind of newer technology. No, that, yeah, no, it is a good question. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm really interested in that sort of like very like material physicality and sort of the horror of having a body. I mean. Um, with the sort of like AI based horror, um, there's there's a really good underwater one actually, which is called uh, Soma, um, where um, you play as this like extracted AI representation of a brain that's exploring this horror space in a scuba suit. Um, so the horror really comes from that idea of like, oh, what it what it is to be conscious, that sort of idea. But with these games, it's very much what it is to have a body that's fallible. Like, how can you have authority over your environment if the, the body you're in, if the body you're exploring in is, um, you know, it, it's it's not made for water. So water is this uh, very, like, antagonistic thing sometimes. I think for me, that antagonism is the appeal of it. Uh, that sort of desire for, oh, it's 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 weird, it's horrible, it's, it's creepy, it's tentacular. What can you... Uh, how how can that sort of be horrifying but also kind of desiring like mm -hmm. what if I'm a submarine and that what of if out of controlness yeah. of uh, it. fantastic thank you very much um we've got another question for you Francis from Dylan um Iron Lung is set in a dystopian future with analog tech I seem to remember are the other games that you discuss also set in the future with dead slash retro technology or are any set in the modern day or past yeah it is a good one because I think most of the games just sort of put you right in the submarine uh kind of contextless and the only world you have within the game is you're in a submarine you are exploring, um, especially with Frontier Diver. Uh, you it, it is it you get a sense that it's an alien world, but it could very much just be like a piece of Earth we've never seen before. And I think that blurring between like reality and like fantasy and science fiction is, I, I guess, sort of the point because you know 
the underwater space is alien. So, yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, another question for Francis, but I uh, I have a question for Kane that relates to this. So I'm going to ask Kane a question, and then I'll come back and ask you Shelley's question because um, I think it might follow on from this quite nicely. So Kane, um, I think you you described how analog features allow players a kind of grounding in reality in games. This kind of idea of authenticity um, of being able to trust kind of physical objects in the game world. Um, and yet in Signalis, you talk about kind of the analog becoming supernatural in and of itself. So there's a kind of tension there between like the real, the authentic, the, 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 the corporeal, like, like, you know, something that we can actually touch and feel um, in the analog and then kind of the analog becoming kind of supernatural. And I just wonder whether you could kind of talk about that tension a little bit, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, I mean, it's it's very much kind of within the context of the, the the story itself. Like, it's a very surreal narrative, and a lot is not revealed to the player in terms of what's real and what isn't. So, in in that framing, even things like analog technologies, um, once again, kind of building on that sense of trust, that sense of trust kind of begins to disintegrate. Um, the kind of trust that we're asked to be to put into these physical objects kind of starts to to break down along with everything else in the game world. Um, notes notes start becoming corrupted, uh, timestamps uh, start going back and forth on them, uh, text is missing, um, the, the cutscenes themselves actually start breaking down. So uh, at certain points, um, the cutscenes will kind of glitch out themselves and kind of show a mishmash of locations from different periods of the game. Um, so there is definitely a, a sense of conflict between what we normally perceive to be the grounding effect of the analog and uh, that um, kind of comes apart in the context of this surreal narrative it really just starts to fall apart fantastic thank you very much and shelly's question for francis kind of follows on from that really nicely i think um shelly says she loved your point francis about the player being asked to trust physical media in the games and wondered if you could speak a little bit more about the connection between analog and trust is there a feeling perhaps that analog media is maybe harder to manipulate for example in well so uh kind of thinking with um Kane's idea about Signalis. Um, so there are some, and I, I literally can't remember the name of it, but like a very classic like 1990s survival game where you'd go into like the safe room and there'd be a computer you could save at. And that was sort of like a metatextual thing, like you're saving on the computer because it's a very literal game. Um, and that's like a, a, a place of trust um, mm. subverted uh, with the breakdown of the um, and look computers in that way. I think with the, the submarine games, I think there's a similar kind of sense because when you start in the machine, this is the machine that's keeping you alive in this like alien, horrible world. But it, the claustrophobia of it gives you a constant sense that this like analog technology is out of date. It can't keep like, it, it, it isn't trustworthy because of its oldness, I guess, which is, I guess, a bit of a, um, yeah, so like a juxtaposition with the idea of like the analog being like a safe, like, oh, it's reliable, it can't be like manipulated because yeah. as we see in these games, they're very much manipulated by horrible Cthulian entities. <laughs> um, uh, Dylan makes a point that uh, um, in the Outlast games, digital technology actually helps to keep you grounded in reality as everything falls apart, which is the complete opposite of what analog tech does in survival horror. So yeah, lots of discussion about analog and trust and so on there. Um, question from, sorry, I've just lost my place. Question from Lindsay uh, for Francis. Can you talk a little bit more about the fact that I think a lot of these games seem to blur the line between diegetic and non-diegetic gaming components and controls and maybe how that contributes um, to feelings of spookiness or uncanniness? Yeah, sure. Um... Interestingly, the, the the screenshot I showed for showing what uh, HUD elements are non-diegetic in gaming, um, it was from uh, a game called Subnautica. Uh, it, interesting that that HUD kind of blurs the line between diegetic and non-diegetic because there's this idea that you're existing in this like digital scuba suit, and so your HUD, whilst we as the players are aware it's for our sake, there's sort of the kfab that the the character is experiencing 
those HUD elements that you see in gaming as part of their like like science fiction visor so they can get information about the world that's for them but it's really for you the player I think there are more games that are playing with the idea of like things gaming takes for granted like the HUD um, mm -hmm. especially with like the idea of like the mini map or the quest marker which uh, I think there's more discussion recently about how those kind of like non-diegetic elements in games kind of disrupt your ability to actually really engage with the world because you don't see the world you see the quest marker you see the map you go there and that's it it stifles exploration um so I think a lot of these games and one of them in particular full fathom it's not out yet but I've been following the development from the developers for a couple of years now and they're very explicit that they want it to be very disorienting like even the menus are diegetic uh so yeah you kind of have that sense that like the player character intermingling in a way that's uncanny fantastic thank you um question for kane from shelley um i wondered if you could say a little bit more kane about what might happen when games in the future start referencing the games that you spoke about that are already <laughs> full of intertextual references to previous games themselves is there a point where it all begins to collapse in on itself um definitely i think so uh i think what makes what makes it work in the case of signalis is that it's very much um it, it ties into the themes and story of the game so well i think it's very much like because it's aiming so much for this sense of like nonsense for this sense of breakdown for this complete compression of all these different references it works in a thematic and story sense but i think in the future when other games start referencing games like that uh, i do think it will eventually kind of collapse in on itself. I do feel Signalis is more of an exception uh, rather than the rule in terms of stuff like this typically working. Um, I think Signalis almost kind of acts as a critique of, of games that may come in the future uh, that may kind of fail in the ways that Signalis has succeeded in all putting all these intertextual references in there. Um, I think there is definitely a point as we go forward and as the, the games continue to mature as a medium that eventually it'll all kind of blur together and won't be <laughs> won't be won't be half as effective the choice of intertextuality um okay question for connor for um for both of you so whoever wants to take this um do any of the games discussed have kind of scare tactics that gaslight players do once stable technologies become unexpectedly unreliable uh connor is thinking of eternal darkness where the game tricks you into thinking that you've accidentally deleted all of your saved data which is so cruel that is mean still that's right that is very mean um i don't know if you you first okay uh one example i was thinking of is i i guess in water womb world is it's not really sort of like tricking the player and that kind of like oh you know you've you've you know ruined your save file because most of these are games you can finish in about 10 minutes so they don't really have that like protracted like <laughs> eking on the play the player like that um but with water womb world there's sort of this point at the end where the the diegetic like HUD I guess your navigation tools they sort of just like disappear away as if you no longer need them because the human is no longer human um, and it's a very like subtle kind of like shift to the the, the way the game presents itself um, that you don't really it it's a very seamless sort of like change from um, not just the character experiencing a new horror reality, but the mechanics themselves, like um, that you've used to play the game this whole time, just disappearing um, because you're you're no longer a human and you no longer need a submarine. Um, I think in terms of survival horror, I feel like Eternal Darkness really hit the the, the nail on the head with those with that technique with the sanity meter causing all those different effects. I feel like every time I click on like a top 10 video of like best jump scares in horror games, or whatever, like so many different things from Eternal Darkness and those mechanics pop up. So I feel like a lot of games kind of try to avoid retreading that same ground. Um, but in terms of Signalis, uh, actually I'm going to ask Mateo to block, block your ears there just because he's playing the game at the moment and this is a story spoiler. But um, there, is, there, 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 there is in, in Signalis because there's a, there's a fake out ending um, the game kind of ends prematurely uh, uh, around um, two thirds of the way through, and the way that affects uh, the kind of interface of the game is that the menu actually changes. If you were to just 
believe this fake out ending and just come away from the game, there would actually be nothing to kind of encourage you to go back and play it again unless you were to kind of um, pay more attention to the game menu um, where certain uh, objects and certain uh, icons have slightly changed and the main character's eye uh, has like, different reflections in it or whatever. So it definitely kind of plays with audience expectations that way in terms of its menu and its interface. Um, I, I think in terms of gaslighting, that's probably probably the biggest one. But in terms of a fake out ending that it doesn't really give you much notice for or explain much after, I feel like they, it, can be, it can be pretty cruel because I think there's a lot of players that think that that's the real ending of the game. Thank you so much to Kane and to Francis um, for great papers and to everybody for their questions. Um, really good discussion uh, in that Q&A. So yeah, much appreciated, everybody. Thank you.